So you might be using Defend Friend Point, but are you using it right? The bottom line is Defend Friend Point is really powerful, but it's so powerful that adversaries can even use it against you. We've done a previous video on five common mistakes in Defend Friend Point, and we're going to follow up with another five common mistakes that if you don't watch out for, could come back to bite you. So let's get into it. First mistake that we're going to examine with regards to defend for endpoint in this video is endpoint security policies and how there might be some stuff hiding in there that you actually really do care about. This is the endpoint security policies page within the Defender XDR portal. If you were to go to Intune and go to the endpoint securities blade in there, you'd really see the same policies. It's two different admin centers that lead to the same set of configurations. If I go to create a new policy here, and I'll choose a platform, and I'm going to go for Windows 10 or server, and we're going to go for Defender Antivirus. This is the most common way that you would configure things like scan schedule settings and all that good stuff. Uh, we'll just type in any old name there to get through, and give this thing to load, and boom, here we go. So we get to see all of these different settings that are all important in their own individual ways with regards to Defender for Endpoint. But you know what? You don't get full control here. Funny little quirk about this is that some Defender antivirus settings that apply on the client and relate to Defender for Endpoint, you can't configure them here. To do that, we actually go to head over to the Intune Admin Center. So let's head there. We'll head to Devices, Windows, then Windows Configuration. We're going to create a policy here, and this will illustrate some of the settings that are missing from Endpoint Security. If we go to Windows 10 or later, we're going to choose the Settings Catalog. We'll create a policy here. I'll just call that anything to go through, and I'll hit Next. I will choose Add a Setting, and let's look at some examples that are missing. Up here, we're going to search for some stuff. If I search for File Computation, we'll see here we've got a policy called Enable File Hash Computation Feature. That sounds kind of cool, right? That basically makes things like indicators of compromise a little bit more reliable. Also, if I go up here and I search for, let's say, quick scan exclusions, didn't like that. Let's just try quick scan. Here we go. Go to Defender. Quick scan includes exclusions. That's another interesting one where if I've set up exclusions, there's a good chance I don't want scans to apply to those either. Now, two of those settings that we've just gone through, as well as some other ones, you can only manage via Intune or there's some other ways. So sometimes through group policy as well. Point being, we're meant to be using that security settings management feature that we first seen over in the Defender XDR portal. We're meant to be able to use that as a unified pane of glass for all configuration. Reality is we're not quite there yet. There are some settings where you've got to go through something like settings catalog to get them. So it's worth exploring that and figuring out, hey, what are the settings that matter to me that I actually have to go through settings catalog to set up? And that's mistake number one. Mistake number two that we're going to explore is you are not taking live response seriously enough. So live response allows us to get that real-time terminal access to a client or a device that's been onboarded into Defend for Endpoint. Then we can run terminal incident response queries like exfiltrate data from it for analysis, run PowerShell scripts and so on. That's very powerful. And so for example, if I head to Endpoints, I go to Advanced Features. And if we scroll down this list here, we're going to be looking for, where is it? I've not gone right past it. Live response. There's a few settings here that we want to acknowledge. First off, live response. Is it on at all? And if it is on, are you also going to put it on for servers? Where you need to start taking live response seriously is the reality that if I have live response permissions on a device, inherently, I'm going to have system level permissions on that device. So that potentially can be used by an attacker or even just an insider who's stepping over their normal bounds to have admin access to devices they should not have admin access to. A really good example of that may be your tier zero assets, where if I have domain controllers, configuration manager servers, certificate servers, if I allow live response to those, well, by default, folks like my security admins over in Entra, they all of a sudden, they kind of become domain admins as well by inheritance. So what are some ways you can manage that? First off, if you need it, control it in here to begin with. Next up, consider RBAC. Um, we're going to head over to permissions in the Defender portal. We'll go to Defender XDR roles. And here's a role that I created earlier. We're going to use that as an example. You will see here, we get the setting here called security operations. And this is going to be a group of permissions. I want to go away and I want to edit that. So let's click into there. And the one we are interested in is live response. This allows me to apply role-based access control to these capabilities. So if I move away from that big all-encompassing admin role of security admin, well, what I can actually do is I can say specific 
live response actions become available to specific administrators and to specific roles. And that's going to allow you to have least privilege and all that good stuff when it comes to managing devices that are onboarded into Defender for Endpoint. Mistake number three we're going to examine for Defender for Endpoint is about passive mode. So passive mode allows you to put Defender antivirus into kind of a setback state where it allows a third party endpoint protection to take the wheel. You still get benefits like EDR, but fundamentally it's not going to do the bulk of the remediation. The mistake we see here is misunderstanding what actually happens then. So for example, one of the mistakes that is less commonly seen is that attack surface reduction, that's not available in passive mode. The one that is less known about is the fact that even in passive mode, you might still get scanning on the device. If you look at this specific example, let's go into that endpoint security policy we were in earlier, and we'll see this setting here called disable catch up quick scan. There we go, this one here. This kind of matters insofar as if I have set out a security architecture and I maybe get really important devices where I've not tested the implications of running Defender scans on them, passive mode by default, you actually have to go away and you have to disable that. Otherwise, passive mode is still going to do that catch up quick scan. There's a few other ones where if you're in passive mode, you may see scans based on, for example, after security intelligence updates. You may see it if there is an option to start the scheduled scan when the device is not in use, stuff like that. So you have to be aware that passive mode still may result in some scan activity on your device. Mistake number four that we're going to cover is to do with tamper protection. And one of the overlooked ways that it doesn't actually protect you. Let's explore what I mean by that. Uh, so we're going to go into the advanced features within Defender XDR. Let's see if we can find tamper protection in here. That is enabled by default now at the tenant level. You can control that per device using the Windows security UI policies within Intune and Defender XDR. In theory, what it's really meant to do is say, hey, even if you're a local admin, you can't do things like disable Defender antivirus. Where the mistake steps in is a misunderstanding of the degree of protection you get with this. At the end of the day, if I got local admin on a device, I don't want to say I got God mode, but that's the security boundary, right? Tamper protection would not, for example, prevent an adversary installing another endpoint protection platform. Windows through its APIs would then realize, hey, you've got this other endpoint protection platform in place. I'm going to automatically put Defender into passive mode. And then as an adversary, I could just add exclusions to that new endpoint protection platform. You see the idea. So you can not directly tamper with Defender antivirus, but you can put a third party in place and then basically remove all the protective elements of that third party. That's mostly a risk on client devices where the different running modes switch automatically. Less of a concern on servers where tamper protection does stop active mode receding back into passive mode. But it's important to understand those expectations with regards to how far tamper protection goes to protect your defender for endpoint. That leads us to mistake number five that we're going to cover in this video, and that is EDR in block mode and just not understanding and using it properly. We're going to stay in this advanced feature page, and I'm going to try and find EDR in block mode. There it is at the top. This is going to be enabled, I believe, by default in tenants now. It's really one of those things that I don't want to say it's a no-brainer because your mileage may vary in all sorts of circumstances, but it would be exceedingly rare on the grand scheme of things that you wouldn't want to enable EDR in block mode. But you'd be surprised at the number of assessments that I do on Defender for Endpoint Environments, and it's been disabled or it's never been turned on. Why might you be interested in this? Well, back to those other mistakes we mentioned. We're talking about passive mode and we're talking about tamper protection. EDR in block mode kind of provides this post-breach security capability. Even if Defender for Endpoint isn't in active mode and you don't get that proper uh, local remediation by Defender antivirus, well, EDR in block mode kind of allows any detections that are driven by the cloud EDR elements and Defender XDR, which is correlating all these signals and sending down response actions to clients. EDR in block mode is what's going to allow that to happen. You can kind of think of it as even if you are in active mode, you can kind of think of enabling it as a type of defense in depth where even if I put in a third party AV, add loads of exclusions to that and completely diminish its protective capability, EDR and block mode may still actually be able to remediate some of the threats that I'm going to face. So hopefully you found this video informative where we covered five more Defender for Endpoint mistakes that we commonly see 
There's a whole bunch more if you're interested in finding out even more mistakes that we see in Defender for Endpoint implementations. Let us know in the comments below and give us a thumbs up in this video so we know we're on the right track. Make sure you subscribe to Threatscape's YouTube channel because we get tons more content like this coming out.